you everyone for coming to today's seminar. So we are very lucky to have a guest speaker today, uh, Gregory Cohen. Gregory Cohen is an associate professor in neuromorphic systems at the International Center for Neuromorphic Systems, ICNS, at Western Sydney University and program lead for neuromorphic algorithms and space applications. Prior to returning to research from industry, he worked in several startups and established engineering and consulting firms, including working as a consulting engineer in the field of large-scale HVAC from 2007 to 2009, as an electronic design engineer from 2009 to 2011, and as an expert consultant for Kaiser Economic Development practice in 2012. He's a pioneer of event-based and neuromorphic sensing for space imaging applications, and his research interests include unsupervised feature extraction, bio-inspired machine learning, and neuromorphic computation systems. Greg holds a Bachelor's of uh, Engineering, Master's of Engineering, and Bachelor of Communications with Honours from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, and a joint PhD from West Sydney University, Sydney, uh, Australia, and University of Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris, France. Uh, so without any further ado, let's make you welcome and uh, get started. <laughs> I should say that I do have a degree from Western Sydney University and one from University Pierre Marie Curie in France. And I don't know what to make of this, but both universities changed their names just after I graduated. So University of Western Sydney became Western Sydney University and UPMC became Russell Moore. So I don't know what to make of that. I try not to take it too personally. So I'm Greg Cohen. I'm from the International Center of Neuromorphic Systems at Western Sydney University. Uh, and I'm going to give you a talk today. Um, it's a bit more of a story than anything else, but the idea really is that I want to tell you about neuromorphic vision systems and neuromorphic cameras and what we're doing with them, both in space and all the way down to actually in our lab with robotic pinball machines and foosball tables. So we're going to talk a lot about applications and how applications have driven what we do at ICNS. So I think the first place to start is what is neuromorphic engineering? Because I think it's not something that everyone knows, and I think even people in the field don't exactly know what it is. So I should also just say, if you guys have questions along the way, feel free to stop me, put up your hand, I'm more than happy to make it a bit more interactive. So we'll take it as you go. So when it comes to neuromorphic engineering, we kind of define it this way with two goals, an engineering goal and a scientific goal. The engineering goals as an engineer, probably the easier one to understand for me, which is really, it's kind of the opposite of biomedical engineering. So in biomedical engineering, you take technology, you put it into biology to solve problems. Neuromorphic engineering kind of goes the other way from an engineering perspective. We look at how biology solves problems, and we take those ideas and those concepts and try to build things, real world systems, sometimes even silicon chips, that try and embody those concepts and use those ideas to get towards the power efficiency, the robustness, the reliability of biological systems. Because ultimately, biology just outperforms most computers and machines on almost on such a wide variety of tasks that we find difficult to do you know, on a conventional way, approach for processing. So that's the engineering goal, build better machines to do tasks. The scientific goal is a bit more complicated, but essentially it's trying to understand how the brain works by building models of neural systems. So if we can build something that works a bit like a neural system in the brain, in silicon, we can explore and play with that and try to figure out what's going on in the brain. So sort of close the loop and go back into the science. It's a lot more difficult, but it's something that's closer to the actual original definition of neuromorphic engineering which was Carver Mead at Caltech in, I think, the 80s, which was literally trying to build networks of neurons in silicon because the way silicon transistors and neurons operate, well, at least sub-threshold transistors, there are a bit of similarities. So he was interested in literally building these networks of neurons. So what is ICNS? That's the research group I have. I'm just going to give a little bit of a plug to my lab. Well, we're one of the largest neuromorphic research labs in the world at the moment. There's at least about 40 to 50 of us, depending on... COVID and the day of the week, essentially. But essentially, we have a mission statement, which is really to focus on these three areas, sensors, algorithms, and processes. So neuromorphic sensing is kind of the easy one. It's about saying, can we build sensors that grab information from the world in a biologically inspired way? So more like the way biology senses the world than conventional sensors. So that's how do we produce data in a biologically inspired way? Because biology clearly sees and senses and interacts with the world in a different way to the way we do with conventional sensors. The processing side also makes sense. It's right, well, now we've got this data. How do we process it in a way that comes close to the reliability, the speed, the robustness of biology? Simply put, brains are consumed about 20 watts of power, but clearly they're extremely good at the computation they do. And it also makes sense, right? 
if you're processing, if you're sensing the world in this new way, the last thing you want to do is take this unique data and make conventional frames out of it and put it into a deep learning system. That will work, but ultimately, you are throwing away quite a bit of the benefits of that processing technology. Yeah, I should probably uh, say that that is definitely the first step you want to do. But ultimately, what you want to do is use the actual way the data is produced to compute in that paradigm. And for what I'm going to show you today, that becomes ex extremely important because when you change the way you do your sensing, if you change the way you do your computation as well on top of that, then you get the benefits right through your system. And really, the reason why that's so difficult is this middle bit here, algorithms. Right? Algorithms are what tie the two together, right? You need the sensors to produce the data, and you need the computation to run the algorithms. But I think the thing that our lab does differently, and I think the approach that we've had is about this. We're driven by applications. And I think that becomes even more important when you look at something like neuromorphic engineering. Because ultimately, the applications, if you understand the application you're trying to target, right, you understand the tasks you need to do, and then you can say exactly what your sensor needs to capture, and then send you what your algorithm has to do, and what processing you need. The problem with neuromorphic engineering is that it's trying to model biology. And biology specializes everything, right? Eyes are specialized for the tasks. We can't see infrared because we don't need to see infrared, right? So if you can't say exactly what you want to do, these become very hard to build and you land up with generalized systems. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but you're not going to get to that power efficiency you need from biology. So I'm going to talk a lot about how applications, how we use those to drive these three areas. So just about, I think it's probably a good point to give you a bit of background about me just to build on that introduction, which thank you for that. So I actually had no intention of going into academia. I went to engineering, I actually applied for medicine, got accepted for engineering because my university made a mistake, landed up getting an engineering degree, and then promptly went off. Uh, I, in fact, my first job was welding on a ship. So I spent six months welding on a ship at the end of my, PA, of my undergrad. Then I went into air conditioning and I worked as an air conditioning consultant for a few years. Loved the design part of that. Hated the fact that most of my job was shouting at contractors decided that actually air conditioning systems are terribly run. We should build remote diagnostic systems for them. That was kind of interesting for a year or two, but it turns out if you take an armful of electronics to a CEO and say, hey, look at this cool thing with all the blue lights, that'll tell me when you're not doing your job. No technical manager in a building will ever say yes to that. So that was doomed to fail. So I thought, okay, this is it. I clearly don't understand business. I'll go get a business degree. So I have a degree in finance, financial analysis and portfolio management. Thought this was a great idea. Lasted three months in research and in finance before I said, I just can't do this. However, I will say that that knowledge, that, re that experience of learning about how finance works and how you know, the money side of things that powers basically everything operates, that has been so useful going forward because you understand things like supply chains. You understand what drives government to fund things and that sort of understanding of the underpinnings that go underneath research, underneath commercialization, underneath industry that proved to be completely uh, valu invaluable when it came to applying for grants and understanding how to get big projects funded. And when you get to space, everything gets expensive. So what happened after that was I thought, oh, geez, I really want to try and make use of all my skills. So I landed up becoming a government consultant. So I worked for a company called Kaiser Economic Development Practice. We worked for McKinsey. We did reports for the government. I loved the research side of things. Didn't like the fact that I quit the job. When I was in a meeting and someone described to me the building street interface, and I was like, what in the world is the building street interface? I meant the pavement. So that whole job was about thinking of big terms for simple things. But I loved the research. So after that, I thought I really want to go into research. So I did my PhD late in life. I was in my late 20s when I started my PhD. And what ended up happening was I did a PhD here in Australia. I did one in, uh, in the Institut de la Vision in Paris. And I came out of that PhD and I looked around and I thought, geez, everyone at the time was working in an event-based slam. That was what everyone was trying to solve. And I looked at this lab I just walked out of with postdocs and PhD students who were far smarter than me, all trying to solve this problem. And then the colleagues I had, let's say, in Singapore and the labs there, and even uh, back in the UK as well, they were all working on this problem. I thought, there's no way I can compete with that. I'm not smart enough. I don't have the mathematical background. I'm a welder from a ship. It was just an, you know, some are far my way here. So I thought, okay, I gotta find something different. So what I did was I focused on applications. I thought, I can't necessarily build better algorithms. I'll wait for them to build those algorithms and I'll find things to use those algorithms for. So I started looking for applications. And I'm gonna present some of these applications to you today. And it's gonna sound like I was like, oh, this is the winner. But the truth is it wasn't. I must've tried 20 different things. And these are the ones that work the best. 
Now, that's not to say all of the other ones are failures for, because they were just bad ideas. Some absolutely were. But other ones, maybe just was the wrong time. And some of them as well, I'll come back to. Sleep research, there's a whole bunch of interesting applications of this in sleep research that I really wanted to explore during my PhD and during my postdoc. Just haven't had time. And it just wasn't right then. But now that I understand how these cameras work, how we've built up this suite of algorithms that us tackle these problems, it might be the right time now. So a lot of this was about you know, saying, how do I make myself different? How do I start my academic career in my 30s? And so far, it's actually worked out quite well. And I'll start by telling you the application that really made it all happen for me, which was uh, space sensing with these neuromorphic cameras. So before I go into that, let me tell you a quick story about what neuromorphic event-based cameras are. Uh, they're a type of vision sensor. They're called silicon retinas sometimes, event-based cameras, event cameras, but they're all the same idea. Essentially, they kind of change the whole way you do sensing. So in these cameras, each pixel in the array is independent and asynchronous. So there's no synchronous readout. So you don't have frames, you don't have exposure times, you don't have motion blur, you don't get saturation effects in the same way. Each pixel only reports changes in log illumination, and only when they happen. And that's sent out asynchronously along this asynchronous bus, essentially. Which means if you take one of these cameras and point it at a static scene, you get no data out. When something moves in the field of view, only the affected pixels send you information. That gives you a few big benefits. Firstly, a huge amount of data is, is just not generated for things that aren't changing. So it suppresses redundant information at the sensor. You also have this high dynamic range because each pixel is only looking for changes and log changes in illumination around whatever set point it's sitting at. Letting you have very bright parts of the scene and very dark parts of the scene at the same time. So you get this high contrast sensitivity. And those events come out really quickly and we timestamp them with microsecond resolution. So you have this temporal resolution. So if you can imagine why it works so well for space is if you're looking up at the sky, most of the sky is dark and nothing's happening, you get no data out. A satellite streaks through your field of view, only the pixels that see that send you information. And they send it to you just as it happens. So not only do you know that something's happened, you know exactly where it's happened in the field of view. So those are some of the really big benefits of these. They're also just, they're low power. Unfortunately, the way we build them is that the processing we do on them is not low power. So that kind of defeats our argument there a little bit, but they can be low power if you build the whole integrated system. The problem, however, is that it doesn't work very well with conventional data. You, if you make frames out of them, you do lose a lot of the benefits. So it's not the right way to process them. However, I'm gonna show you some videos in which I have made frames out of them to show you. So a lot of that benefit retains, but if you wanna to get to the real core of it, you need to work with the events in their natural way they're emitted. And the problem is that conventional computer vision algorithms just don't work anymore. You need to develop new ones. And that's where we are now. We've developed a whole suite of these that work on the data naturally and the way it's emitted. And then this lets us do these sort of exciting applications. So I'll show you a few videos just to give you an idea of what the data looks like. Um, actually, this is just a nice little example. This is a bit of a history lesson. This is Edward Mybridge's first recording of a horse galloping. First motion video. In fact, this is not the first one, but this is based on the first one. He wanted to settle a bet to see whether a horse's legs are all off the ground when it's galloping. It turns out if you slow it down, it's true. All four legs leave the ground when the horse is running over there. So not the way you'd expect, but he won his bet. This is the birth of video as a currently you know, motion video. But this is essentially set up by having a row of cameras, each triggered as the horse runs past and taking a picture. And that's essentially how we still do video cameras today. We take frames at a constant frame. But you're taking a picture of everything. All that background is captured every time one of those cameras takes an image. And a lot of that is redundant information. So where neuromorphic cameras help is that they only see the changes. So if you do this with a neuromorphic camera, this is actually a real recording of a horse galloping. You can see you only get the changes and where they're changing. But of course, you get this with a high temporal resolution. So you can slow this down as slow as you want. This is the same data just play it back at 10,000 frames a second. But only the pixels that are changing send you information. So the whole recording here is smaller than, you know, two or three of the frames from the video before. So just a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, now I'll show you some data from little micro UAV. This is one of the oldest recordings we have. This is my colleague and I, Garrick, in Telluride. We're having the camera, little UAV with an event-based camera on it. I like this because you have the sun in the top left over there. And because the camera's staring directly into the sun, those pixels saturate. But notice how it sees the rest of the world if the sun isn't there. You can even see our shadows on the ground. That's because of this dynamic range. Those pixels saturate, but the rest of the pixels see the world in a completely unaffected way. In a second, you'll see panning across some trees. And I really like this part of the recording because you'll see in a second how much depth you can see as it pans across these trees. And it's so nice and smooth. That's because although we're making frames out of this data, here you go, see, yeah, this is a 240 by 304 pixel sensor, by the way. Although we're making frames out of it, we're capturing all the information between those frames, so we can make this nice, smooth, blurring transition between it. 
to reverse the problem, this is a recording I did with, that's actually Toby Delbrook on the ground who developed these sensors. We now have the drone flying above a camera on the ground over there. It's a slightly newer camera, but the same sort of thing. You'll see the sun in the field of view and the quadcopter, and you'll see that we're largely unaffected by it. But we can take the same data and render it, as you'll see, at 25 frames a second. And you'll see, you can see it pretty clearly. The sun doesn't really affect us. But you can take that same data and just render the frames at a different frame rate by binning the information differently. So you do that 3,000 frames a second, and now you can see the individual rotors spinning pretty clearly. Same data. We haven't changed anything but the post-processing. But you have microsecond resolution, so there's no reason why you can't go further than that. So we can do the same thing at 10,000 frames a second, and now it's a bit more involved than it sounds, but you can actually start seeing how the drone is about to move by looking at which rotors are slowing down and which ones are speeding up. But the real reason I like to show this video is the second part, which is that it just happened to be a nice hot summer's day in Sardinia. This is at the Capacaccia workshop, and there were a whole bunch of insects flying around. And watch this one insect there by the sun. Watch what he does. He flies directly through the sun twice. And we see it the whole time. Because one of the interesting things about looking for changes, so you see occlusions just as well as you see positive changes. So as that insect flies in front of the sun, we can see it still. This is not something you can do with an integrated camera. You just saturate. Right? And keep in mind, we can still see the quadcopter on the side of this. So just a really interesting example of how just changing the sensing paradigm changes everything. The last little bit of a demo I'll show you is this old experiment we did for the Australian Air Force. You know, you've got to be straightforward with the Air Force. They, you, know, you can do fancy experiments, but then you know, recognizing planes is something that they understand. So we took these four planes. They all are largely the same, and we dropped them freehand in front of a camera into a box. And the idea is, as, as they fall, they're spending a very short amount of time in front of the camera, about you know, 12, uh, 120 milliseconds. So a real high-speed classification task. Can you tell which plane it is as the plane is falling in front of it? And it was just a real-world demonstration of something that starts playing on the benefits of these cameras, the high-speed nature of them. And we built an end-to-end -end processing system in this event-based paradigm to do this. This is what the data looks like. Normal camera on the left, event-based camera on the right. I, I always switch the colors because I'm very colorblind. So this is an old recording. I'm so, apologies. The different colors are just on and off events. We used a 240 frame a second camera over here, and as you can see, it's still pretty good, even on the frame-based one. But you can go whatever frame rate you want with the event-based data, and it's still nice and smooth. But the real reason I like to show this is for this graph over here. This is a total plot of the data produced by those two cameras on a logarithmic axis. On the top is the frame-based camera at 240 frames a second. On the bottom is the event-based data. Notice the two graphs here. The orange line is the frame-based data. And it is orders of magnitude more. It's 600 megabytes versus 640 kilobytes. Now, I'm being a little disingenuous because that's the raw uncompressed data from the camera, not the compressed data stream. But if you're going to process it, that's what you land up processing, right? Whereas the event-based data has two really interesting things. Firstly, far less data. But secondly, notice here, when the plane entered the field of view, you get this jump in the data rate. The camera told you something was happening. So you get saliency for free. You know something's happening because you see this jump in the data rate. So that's one of the exciting things about these cameras. You can actually use the output of the sensor. They become activity driven. Instead of pulling frames out the camera and looking at them, the camera pushes information to you and lets you know when something's happening. Right, so there's definitely more information in the top video, but the point is if we can do the task with the bottom one, and we can in this case, then we should use that. There's far less data to transmit, to store, and to process. So you can get to a far more efficient system. Unfortunately, this will do a very bad job of anything other than detecting planes though. And that's the trade-off. It becomes a specialized system. So now let's talk very quickly about space imaging and why we should do this. So the field that we're really talking about is something called space situational awareness, this idea of tracking things in space. This is important because we've been launching things into space since the 60s. We've done a pretty terrible job of keeping track of what's up there and cleaning up after ourselves. So every time we put a launch up, a bit of debris stays in space. The more debris there is, the more the risk of collisions between different spacecraft, uh, items in space, satellites, even crude spacecraft goes up. And this is a really, really big problem because this is critical infrastructure for us. Space, is, space infrastructure touches every aspect of our lives, from GPS, communication satellites. This is critical, and we basically do nothing to protect this. Um, the interesting thing is that you know, we need to start cleaning up space. We need to start legislating and figuring out who's responsible for things in space. But we can't do any of those until we figure out where things are. Because you can't police something if you don't know how bad the problem is. Similarly, you can't start cleaning it up until you know that. So, Tracking is one of the most important things. It's a difficult task. And this is where neuromorphic cameras can really help. I'm just going to need to describe two things about things in orbit. You might notice this really dense cloud of objects around Earth. That's low Earth orbit. That's where we put all the CubeSats, those mega constellations you hear about. The ISS and the Hubble telescope are in that narrow band of low Earth orbit satellites. Then you've got this region in the middle, which is medium Earth orbit. That's where you'll find GPS satellites. There's not as many satellites in here, 
this is kind of the worst of both worlds. Here you're still protected by the atmosphere. Out here you need a much bigger satellite and you're much further away. But you might notice this ring of satellites around here. That's the geo belt. That's the geostationary satellites whose orbit matches the Earth's rotation. So they stay in a fixed position above the ground relative to us because they're rotating at the same speed of the Earth. That's great because it means if you have satellite TV, you don't have to move your satellite dish. Right? But that also means this is a highly contested area. It's far away. It's 32,000 kilometers away. We really need to know what's going on up there. And the scary thing is how little we actually know. So where do event best cameras help? Well, oh, this is just the team of people working on this. So I should just say thank you to everyone here. Uh, we've grown quite a bit in size. Um, I also need to just say that a lot of this work has been funded by the Air Force especially Plan Jericho within the Air Force, who are the guys crazy enough to give me money to build these astrosites I'll talk about in a second, and to the D to DSTG, who let us play with their telescopes at the beginning. So just thank you to all these people, um, half of which are now in France again. Um, this is just a picture of some telescopes, and i just like to use this. So these are the sort of telescopes we're going to do all the experiments with. Most of the secret behind astronomy is not the telescope, it's the mount. This robotic mount is the expensive part that does all the heavy lifting. And all I want you to notice from these is that this is a conventional telescope, four-sided with another one. That's the conventional astronomy sense in the back here. It's a big block. It's actively cooled, really expensive piece of kit, compared to the event-based camera here, which is a prototype not designed for this. You can even see the screws hanging out of this one over here. This sensor over here is not by any means the same engineering quality of that one, but we can still do tasks with those prototype sensors you can't do with the top one. And these are the sort of sensors that I'll show you all the results on. This is where we were about 2016. This is what we have now. These are our astrocyte containers. So they're full mobile telescope observatories built into shipping containers. So the roof slides off, a scissor lift or a lifting mechanism lifts the telescopes up, we do our observations, and we pack ourselves away. It's a shipping container, you can move it with any truck to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, put it on a ship, put it on a train. And the reason we can do this is interesting. Because as I said to you, the cameras are fast, and we don't get this motion blurring effect. So we're far less sensitive to motion. So with a normal telescope observatory, you sink concrete in the ground, you build a building around it, you try to get rid of every vibration, every bit of motion. But with neuromorphic sensors, the motion's good. In fact, it helps us. So sometimes if I can't see something, I tap the telescope. It really upsets astronomers. But here, <laughs> with these guys, we can use it to our advantage. We don't need this to be on a stable platform. You can just plonk it down anyway. It doesn't matter if it wobbles a bit. Plug it in and start doing observations. So we're using the actual technology to build something as large as this that leverages the very fact that the silicon inside them operates in a different way. So we have two of these guys, and these are where all the results I'm going to show you come from. I'm going to start off by showing you where it started. This is actually the sketch of my boarding pass that I showed to the Planjerica guys when they said, can you do something cool with your technology? I said, I'll build this. And three months later, we actually had it at the Avalon Air Show on display. It was kind of this weird process of going from an idea in your head to something that you could actually walk inside and sit in a chair and point at the sky. So kind of an amazing process, really just you know, sometimes you just got to go big and say, okay, if you want me to impress you, I'll build this. We said we'd do it in three months. It almost killed us, but we actually got it going. So this is what it looks like inside. It's kind of a cozy way to do it. Uh, this is observing in quite a civilized way. It has an air conditioner, so you can do this out in the desert. But you can also operate these things entirely remotely now, which is kind of cool. So I was back in South Africa last year operating telescopes here in Australia, which is kind of nice. So this is it. This is the first recording we ever took of a star through an event-based camera. And you can see that it's kind of jumping up and down a bit. That was us just excitedly jumping up and down next to the telescope. But you also might notice there's a circular pattern to it. That's atmospheric distortion. And that turns out to be really important for adaptive optics. And that's now a whole different field of research. But this is what we're looking at. This is with DST 2016. We're just playing around to see what it would look like. We had no idea why we wanted to do this or what we were going to get out of it. Ultimately, uh, this was not so interesting. This means we focus the thing. We're quite excited. But we're recording later that evening. This was just an accidental recording when all of a sudden through the field of view we saw this come through. We had no idea what that was. And there was arguments. People were like, well, it could be high altitude geese, it could be aircraft. We had no idea. And it was really exciting, but you know, eventually it dawned on us that now we're next to an airbase, it can't be a plane. We realized that's a low Earth orbit satellite. And that was the aha moment because someone said to us, hold on a second, you can see it like that? And I was like, yeah. We plotted it in 3D and you can see. It's like, that's really important because we have trouble seeing this. In fact, when you look at it on a conventional image, it's just a streak. So this was the moment where someone said, Greg, you need to spend a bit of time doing this. Can you come back next week? And that's where everything skyrocketed up. So this is what happens when you take the telescope and you point it at a satellite and you follow it across the sky like this. On the left, you can see the frames that you generate from this, right? Not that exciting, but if you look at the data it's really producing, we've got time on the vertical axis because these cameras produce this high temporal resolution. You can see that satellite gives you this really rich set of events that really describes the object well. What you're seeing shooting through the field of view are stars. 
this has so much more information than that when it comes to tracking an object. So by contrast, this is what it looks like on a normal conventional CCD camera. It takes an exposure every four seconds. The stars are all streaks because you're integrating and the stars are moving. That slightly brighter streak, that's the satellite. So you can see our representation is far more interesting. It has so much more information about the object to the point you can start characterizing and figuring out things about the object, like whether it's tumbling or not, because you see glints in that pattern. Now, the question is, that works really well for low-Earth orbit satellites, but what about geosynchronous satellites? Remember I told you they don't move relative to us, and these cameras don't generate events if, you can't, if nothing is moving? That's easy. You just move the telescope. So now we move the telescope across the object, and it's as if we're still and the object is moving. Right? And that's really an important part of these cameras, which is that you need to incorporate motion into how they work. And if you incorporate motion into your sensing paradigm, everything changes, and you can do things you simply can't. So you can see the geosynchronous satellite coming down here. This is old stuff. I'll show you some new stuff in a second. By the way, on a conventional sensor, they get a dot. We get that nice object. That's where we were. This is just, by the way, Jupiter and some moons. As you can see, when you move it, you get the blurring on the frame-based camera, but the events are nice and smooth. I should have played a second time. Um, but you can see how we can move this image quite nicely. So this is the moment when I say, if anyone here is an astronomer, look away. This is absolutely what you shouldn't do next to a telescope. But you can do stuff like this. And you can see, you can still see the object, but you get blurring in the frame base. And this turns out not to be a problem at all for us. We can handle that as long as we know the motion. So that was where we were in 2016, let me or 2018. Let me show you where we are now. This is tracking a rocket body. You can see resolution's gotten better. Everything's gotten better. You can see the stars going through. And you can see, like, there's no doubt about where this thing is. This whole recording is about half a megan size. It's ridiculously small. So rocket bodies, not so exciting. Geosynchronous satellites, we've gotten a little bit better as well. You saw that blurry image. This is where we are now. The geosynchronous satellites over there, it's not moving. These are stars moving through the field of view as the Earth rotates. I mean, like a different world. You can use these stars to figure out exactly where you're pointing. So this is kind of the evolution from where we were, that one star we saw, to this, a whole star field moving through the field of view. This is just really kind of cool to give you an idea of how much we can see. Oh, that video didn't play. Oh, okay, anyway. Um, this is uh, using the telescope in high wind conditions, what you'll see is here's the object we're tracking. It comes in, wobbling a little bit. The whole telescope is moving like this. Things get a little out of control. Even the stars are wobbling in the background. Turns out not to be a problem. It gets, it gets really windy. Uh, but we can still figure out where everything is because everything's moving. As long as we have some idea of the motion, it's like a whole, the whole sky is affected in the same way. So you can do interesting things like this. You change the paradigm. You change the application. You can do an image in conditions that no one else can image in. So, I should also say that is the terrestrial stuff. One of the more exciting things we're doing later this year is putting two of these cameras on the International Space Station to look down in a project we do with the Air Force Academy called Falcon Nero. One camera will look straight down, which is Earth observation, and the other one looks towards the horizon where it'll see a bit of the sky. Fundamentally, it's to look for a type of atmospheric phenomenon called sprites, so the sort of electrical discharge from the clouds up into the atmosphere, right? But also we just kind of see what we can see, right? So it's a really exciting project. These cameras are low power, low data rate, high speed, perfect for CubeSats. Unfortunately, the problem with CubeSats are that everything else in the CubeSat can break. The ISS has been up there for a while. It's still working. You get a whole bunch of power. You get a whole bunch of data down from whenever you want. And you get an astronaut who can go push the reset button for you if you need to. So we're really excited. This launches in November. And um, well, I can't really, this may or may not be the first event-based camera in space, uh, depending on what happens next week. So I, I can't say anything more than that, but let's just say you, you might read something about uh, event-based cameras in space sooner than that. Um, just now to wrap up, oh, uh, by the way, we're going on the Columbus module, so that's the part of the International Space Station we're putting out. Let's talk a little bit about robotic foosball. So we're gonna switch gears 180%. Now we're going from the Earth down to something we do in the lab. And the question is, why is this an application? Now, space tracking, I can motivate that for you, it's easy. We need to know where stuff is in space, and we're making space safer. Robotic foosball is a bit more complicated, but it's actually a really important point, which is that when it comes to looking at neuromorphic systems, we have trouble trying to convince people why you should use these systems. I mean, I know why. I've convinced myself, but I need to convince everyone else here. And the problem is that when we try to do that, we run into some problems, which is primarily computer vision, machine learning is all based on data sets, improving things on data sets. And the problem is that, especially when you start doing tasks where you move the camera, you can't really have a data set anymore. These are dynamic problems, right? When your sensing depends on what you just saw, right? If you want to try capturing that data set, you have to have all these branches and you can't capture all of that. So static data sets do not do a good job of 
representing neuromorphic systems. And furthermore, if we start working with neuromorphic data sets, we tend to limit how we approach the problem to fit the data set. So we need ways to convey how our systems work and how to compare and contrast them. They don't have these problems. They let us have these dynamical problems. So everyone knows MNIST. That is the data set in machine learning. It's basically your sanity check. It's a great problem because it's small. You don't have to download ImageNet to get it to work. Everyone understands the task. It's digital recognition. It's small, it's quick, it's easy, and it's relatable. So that's kind of become the ubiquitous data set. We then, of course, the neuromorphic community, and I'm as guilty as this because I was part of this, we made a neuromorphic version. Well, how do you look at static digits with an event-based camera? You move the camera or you move the digit. If you move the digit, however, on a monitor, for example, the camera will actually pick up the refresh rate of the monitor, and that causes problems. So this was the second data set. MNIST DVS was the first. And there were, com there were, I wouldn't say complaints, but there were concerns around what was happening with the refresh rate of the monitor. Again, cameras are not built to be tested this way. And MNIST was a good idea, but honestly, if you know the motion, you can just flatten it back to the MNIST digits into your classification that way anyway. So we're getting close to the problem. We looked at this and thought, well, how do we make it better? Hmm. Why is this thing not working anymore? Oh. Okay. So we tried it with an e-ink display because it has no refresh rate. That lets us vary the light level, for example. Try different motions. Uh, better way to solve the problem, but not perfect. And then, of course, there was that plane dropping data that I showed you at the beginning. That's getting closer to what we want, but still a very static and very well-defined problem where, you know, it doesn't really represent a real-world situation. So we thought, how do we do something different? Well, it all goes back to the Telluride Neuromorphic Workshop, which happens every year in Telluride, well, except for last year when it was virtual. But essentially, it's a great workshop. If you have the opportunity to go, I would recommend it. You spend most of the day, the mornings in lectures, afternoons doing project work, and in the evening, everyone goes down to the Sheridan Bar. It's like an American movie. And we all cluster around a foosball table and a pool table, and we, we uh, you know, just relax. But we've been joking for years that we should build a robotic foosball table. And then one year we said, you know what, let's just do it. And it turns out to be a really important idea because foosball's a great problem. This is our robotic foosball table. This is the one in our lab. It turns out to be a, a fantastic problem because it's simple, right? Everyone understands it. You can get a five-year-old up to a table and they'll learn how to play pretty quickly. But it turns out to be a surprisingly difficult problem to solve. It looks simple. Track the ball. Everyone in event-based vision says, oh, high-speed tracking is easy. It is easy until you don't actually track a ball in a real-world problem you'll see how much more difficult it turns out to be. So watch this. This is the reason. This is, this is called a snake shot. Watch this. Ball disappears, right? That's a legal move in foosball. Humans can play against this. I've never seen a computer algorithm that can. If you start analyzing a snake shot, you'll see that in, you know, it's the last 90 milliseconds where you can just about see the ball. So if you take frames, you can see the ball there. You can sort of see an orange blur over here, and then it's gone. You can't do that problem with a frame-based camera unless you have a high-speed camera, but then you've got to deal with the data coming out of that high-speed camera. And that's a hard problem in itself, because the problem with these games, and this is really the point that I'm going to make here, is that you are facing the tyranny of time. If you're not fast enough, you just can't do it. It doesn't matter where the ball was. It barely matters where the ball is. You only care about where the ball will be. Right? And that's when neuromorphic systems are good, because they're supposed to be fast. Right? If you're trying to learn this do machine learning, for example, this is what the data looks like in an event-based camera, by the way. You can see as the ball rolls, you can just see the ball moving. And that should be easy, except you've got all these other things. You've got people moving their hands. You can see the reflection of the metal rods across the table. The data is not clean. If you try to use a simulator, for example, you don't simulate all that noise. So your algorithm works perfectly until you try it in a real-world system like this. Then it falls to pieces. So we had a lot of people trying deep learning techniques in this. And they had some modicum of success, but the problems are always the same. Latency, you just can't get it fast enough. You land a batching things, so you put 100 frames of data in to get to look at just the last result. And it just took small amounts of motion in order to throw the whole algorithm off. I mean, you could definitely count for that, but it just takes so much more training time. And, it, you know, five-year-olds don't have to do that. And, of course, if you surround a table like this with five-year-olds, they shake the whole thing to pieces, right? And that doesn't affect the human player, but it breaks every algorithm we put on it to date. This is our actual table playing against a human person. And you can see varying light levels. The guy has a lanyard that keeps getting in the way. But the algorithm does a pretty good job. On the very simple level, <laughs> it's just blocking. But the idea is that there's levels you can put onto this problem to make it more interesting. Once you've solved the blocking problem, can you make it play more aggressively? Can you build up high level strategy? And it's just a fun problem where you can get people in and say, can you solve this challenge problem? So this is where we were. One of the reasons why pattern matching fails is these are five images. Only three of them are the ball. The other three, uh, two of them are the ball. 
three of them are players. If you look at frames, it's really hard to figure it out. You have to be dynamic. You have to track the ball. You have to have context in order to figure out what's going on. Humans are great at this. Most of our algorithms, even the event-based ones, struggle with this exact problem, which is that players look like balls, especially if they're moving. So how do we get into robotic pinball? This is the last part I'll mention. Well, we looked at robotic pinball. It's a fun problem, right? Everyone enjoys it. But it's got some limitations in that how do you know if you're good at foosball? I can beat people, but I mean, like, I'm not hard to beat. Like, so if you judge your algorithm best and if you can beat me, you're not doing great. So we looked at something and said, well, let's, let's see what other stuff I can get the university to buy without complaining too much. So the next thing was a robotic pinball machine. And this actually makes a whole lot more sense because think about it. What's pinball? It's two inputs, left and right. That's it. Two buttons. It's all about timing, right? And on top of that, you have a score. So it doesn't matter. If you bring an algorithm, it doesn't matter what you use. If you score more on pinball over 10 games than I am, you are better at playing pinball. It's an extremely well-defined task with a simple metric for success, right? And, you know, it's all about the timing. And if you're not fast enough, that ball is not going to stop and wait for you to finish processing. If you can't keep up, you lose. So it's a great problem where you say, now you've really got to put your money where your mouth is and say, can you build a system that can handle this sort of level of processing? And I mean, you know, it's a bit of the tyranny of time here again in that it's a slow down. It's actually quite easy to do. We have a little algorithm that runs with two neurons and just keeps three balls in the air. That's kind of easy. But what happens now is that because we are in complete control of the whole table and the way the scoring is, we can actually change the rules of the game, right? You can add multiple balls. That's not a problem. You can add distractor balls. You can make balls of different material. You can change the way the scoring works. You can have the algorithm aim for somewhere, for example. You know, you could say, avoid this ball, but always hit this ball. Those are all things you can vary quite easily and see if your algorithm can use it. We can vary the light conditions, for example. So this is what we're using to benchmark these systems. To say, well, here's a dynamical problem where our sensing dictates how we're going to move next. And in this case, we actually are starting to use cameras that move and track the ball. And we use the motion of how the camera's trying to track it to figure out what's going on as well. And this gives us a platform to compare that to a static camera, for example. And I don't know if you can do that with the data set. But ultimately, the idea is to bring people in and say, if you can do better at this task than us, you've built a better foosball playing robot. So the last thing I'll show you here is just a little graph. Of, we looked at data sets around. And you get conventional data sets at the top, neuromorphic data sets at the bottom. As you can imagine, lots more conventional data sets. We divide it into open loop and closed loop. Lots of open loop conventional data sets. That's your normal data set. You actually get a few closed loop conventional data sets. Those are things like driving simulators or AlphaGo, for example. Those are problems where you feed back from the problem into how you do the sensing, what happens next. In neuromorphic engineering, we've copied conventional approaches and we've met lots of static data sets, but there are no closed loop neuromorphic data sets. We could only find two that came close. One is a pencil balancing robot that was built in Germany. It's kind of cool. It uses an event-based camera to balance a pencil. Great, but not much, not much room to move from there. And then a predator-prey system that Toby Delbert built. But unfortunately, he took that data and represented it as a static data set rather than a, a live problem. And that's where we want to work. This is where we prove how neuromorphic engineering works. It's in that block over there. And with that, I think I've run out of time. But uh, OK, you can see the clouds. And you can see through bushes. So that's where I'll leave, I'll leave it then, I think. I'm more than happy to take some questions. Yeah. I'll talk about it very quickly. So I'll jump to this side over here. All you've got to really know about this is that this was based on trying to see the clouds. But we looked at what we're doing in space and said, okay, cool. Um, can we see through the clouds? And we found an algorithm that could do it by separating on velocities. Because you know everything's moving in space. The moon moves slowly, the clouds move faster. You can separate those out quite easily, quite in real time without too much issue. And we thought, well, can we apply that somewhere else? And it's really just about saying space actually turns out to be a really good place to try out algorithms and ideas that you can then bring to the ground. We took the same idea of trying to see through the ground by separating on velocity surfaces. We put a camera on a translation platform with a set of bushes in front of it. The stick wall you see over there on the right, you can't really see through it. Um, and we move the camera in a way behind it. And essentially what happens is as the camera moves, the pixels that are seen through the gaps in the sticks, see the walls of the sticks aren't there, and they don't have exposure issues because they're independent. And because you know how they're going to move, you know where the obstructions are. So you can build this map of the obstructions. And then you can piece together what's on the other side. Much like when we walk past a white picket fence, we can see what's on the other side, even though we have obstructions. So we can do that. And this is the scene we tried to image over here. That's my colleague Saeed, some objects on the table. We ran in traffic film we had in our lab for some reason. 
uh, this is the data from a normal camera on that moving platform. Yeah, the flows. There you go. Um, doesn't really help. But here's the event-based camera. The raw data is the camera scene. This, the obstructions are seen through. But then, because you know that things far away are going to be more than things close to you, so parallax, you can use those to make two different velocity surfaces. You divide out a near field and a far field. And you can start seeing on the near field, this is moving, you can start seeing objects forming on the table. And in the far field, you can actually start seeing the structure of the room. So this is just one part, but you could theoretically go backwards and forwards and build up a rich, rich model of what's on the other side. So that's really just using motion and the sensing together to image static parts, the slow moving parts, and the fast moving parts of the scene. And this runs in real time. And let's just do things like see the clouds, for example, and do astronomy when it's cloudy. Which is kind of cool. so. Yeah. Hey, great, great talk. I, I have two questions. Uh, the first is for the astronomy applications, let's just say a bright dot against the black background. How, what's the potential for like sub pixel detection with these sort of sensors? Uh, and the second question was, uh, if I was trying to make a conventional camera competitive with your techniques, I'd probably try and leverage the fact that most of the things you're observing have momentum and relatively short-term predictable things, but there must be applications where you're tracking things that have very little concept of momentum or inertia that immediately change direction uh, randomly. I was wondering if you've got any examples of that sort of stuff. So the nice thing about space is everything is moving and most things that we expect are moving in a predictable way. But absolutely things that are moving under their own power don't necessarily follow orbits. So things that are changing orbits, things that are exploding. For example, one thing that you might want to observe is during a rocket launch where it's going to deploy multiple CubeSats. Right? It's going to go up and it's going to fire these CubeSats off as it goes up. That's a huge problem for the whole space community because it takes a long time to figure out which satellite is which and which is going where. Right? And there you've got these non-linear trajectories where you can't easily predict what's going to happen. So, um, unusual satellite orbits as well. And you get things that pass in and out of the sun's reflected area. So the easiest time to see satellites is when the sun is setting, so you've got the straight line between the sun and you. But as that changes, satellites come in and out of illumination from the sun. So they do sometimes appear and disappear. The problem, and what I should have actually said, there's a lot of the stuff we can do during the day. It's a bit more tricky to quantify how well we do that during the day, but we can absolutely see satellites during the day with these cameras. And if you're integrating, you simply can't do that. You simply can't integrate that much light because we're seeing the occlusions from the positive changes. So there are some really interesting results using high-speed cameras, but then you've got to deal with the high-speed data output. And one of the interesting things, for example, is closely tracking with these cameras. If you want to track a star with one of these cameras, what you're really trying to do is move the mouse you can't see the star, right? If you track it perfectly, you won't see it. If you start going too fast, you'll see the one edge. If you go too slowly, you see the other. So you know how to track it. That's a closed loop system that you need a high-speed camera for. And that's much harder to do with a frame-based camera. Did that answer? Uh, yeah, the first one was about well, how small the oh, thing small. can you see. Right. Uh, so you can absolutely get sub pixel resolution if you know your motion. And the great thing about the telescope mounts are that we do move them quite uh, specifically. Um, we can see, well, our field of view is about 0.1 degrees. It depends on the telescope optics. What limits us more than the actual position is the movement of the atmosphere. That's what's always going to wash us out. But what's nice is that. If you can see the star field behind it, you can do plate solving and you can figure out the location of the stars and actually pinpoint that satellite far more accurately than you would even with the optical resolution. Thanks. Yeah. Can you make a cheap Hawkeye system with this event camera? Hawkeye, oh, like the ones for uh, tracing a tennis ball? Oh, I would absolutely think so, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of. Well, with enough money, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, a second quick question. Are these event camera used also for communication between robots? Because you, you can have one robot uh, flashing and another robot uh, interpreting this uh, signal. I've never seen anyone do that, but you could absolutely do that. I remember in um, Livic, so near Versailles, mm -hmm. they were uh, testing uh, some communication uh, between car or discussing mm -hmm. this, but then uh, I've never... Uh... So what, what we often do is, if you take a, a, an LED and you modulate it at a known frequency, what happens is that generates events at that frequency. So you essentially do the equivalent band pass filtering the output of the camera. And if you know the frequency, you'll just get a dot on the output exactly where that object is. So you can have multiple ones of these to make fiduciary markers and things. Yeah. So we do that, and that's not really communication, but that's just a way of 
at no markers and no frequencies. But yeah, absolutely, you could. And I mean, I would imagine for things like laser communications, you could probably do that over quite, quite impressive distances. I, I work with laser aging telescope systems as well, where they literally shoot a laser at the satellite to measure the, the time it takes to come back to get the distance. And they have all sorts of problems with optical flaring and you know, event-based cameras seem to do a lot better at that because you know that if you just look at certain parts of the image, you can ignore the rest. You don't have that saturation effect across the sensor. Um, there you go. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I've got a question. I really like the foosball table example that you had. Um, and you showed the one player doing the snake shot and then another player doing some turning. Uh, so what do you think is the biggest limitation now? Is it still the perception and the sensing? Is it going to be the actuation, the speed, or is it going to be the strategic placement of the rows? It's the, it's the link between the actual actuators and the control and the camera system. So we can track it fast enough. But we can't get signals from the, you need to have it more closely integrated with the motor controls. At the moment, it goes via PC, and that's the slow part. So there's just that much latency that it becomes easy to beat. So we are in the process of actually getting a proper uh, international quality foosball table, and we're going to build a far more robust mechanism. In fact, we're going to build two for one on each side, so you can have computer versus computer as well as human versus computer. So we, we need to rebuild that and we just need the control system to be reactive. That's really the part. That thing, we bought that to A use and B ship across to the US and still have work on the other side. So it's kind of remarkable that it survived two trips to the US and back. Um, I don't have experience with event as camera, but in the videos where the ball is rolling, there's a tail behind the, the ball. What, what is that? So see, the cameras generate events in response to positive changes and negative changes in light. So if the light intensity increases, you get one type of event, and if it decreases, you get another. Uh, those other events do tend to lag the on events a little bit because the way the sensor works, it's just about, it just takes longer to register that there's a decrease in brightness than an increase in brightness. That's one part of it. But also a lot of the surface we show you actually show you events over time as a gradient. So it just makes it easy to see things because if you just look at the raw events, it's one of the issues of making frames of things. If you just put events, it's hard to see what's going on. If you accumulate the last part of the, say, the last seconds worth of events and then you just grade them out, it's much easier to see what's happening. It's not really a true reflection of what's in the data. It's just a way to show it that makes it easy to see streaks and movement. So it's an artifact of the way we render. We call, they're called time surfaces. They're a weirdly controversial point of oh, neuromorphic engineering. The question from online. Um, uh, another David asks um, Can you use the high time resolution event based data to interpolate a 30 FPS RGB video of the same scene to create a video of higher FPS? So I've seen a few bits and pieces of that. Firstly, these cameras are all monochrome. We do have a color based event based camera in our lab. Uh, with the, well, we have one made of actual color filters and one with a Bayer filter in front. That gets a lot more complicated because then you've got color events and that is a whole minefield. We don't really know, there's no direct analog to event-based color as there is to integrated color. So that in itself is a minefield. But I have seen a few projects that have used uh, GANs and event-based uh, data to recreate frames. So one of the really interesting things to do would be to take a frame, normal camera and an event-based camera, see if you can reverse motion blur, for example, using the highest speed events and then the conventional frame-based camera. The point is that the event-based camera takes care of a photo. So if you're trying to produce a photo, you're probably using the wrong tool, using the event-based camera. But uh, you can absolutely upsample with things like GANs, but you know, it becomes hard to say whether you're doing a good job or not, right? One of the more interesting ones I've seen is try to generate stereo setup where you generate the left eye from the right eye with an event-based camera. That gets more interesting. Uh, great talk. Uh, thanks for the talk. I'm uh, just wondering, like, when the time, because all the, you mentioned about the benchmarking uh, during the talk and the temporal information as well. Uh, these events, if the events are actually not at a synchronous time, but the time is actually changing, then is it possible to still be able to segment it out? Or how do we find that time information? Because all this is relevant to how we are actually interpreting the time of the events. Okay, so, so, I, let me see. so I'm not sure if I fully understand your question. 
but um, maybe the way to explain is that how the camera actually produces the events asynchronously. So the original camera just didn't even take a clock. You literally just, it's an event is ready, you read that event off and then you can read the next event. So if you're faster at reading the events and the camera generates them, then I mean, you then get those events as they happen. We put a timestamp on it at that point. If you built a system that was uh, fast enough, you could actually just process the events when they arrive. You wouldn't need to timestamp them. So the timestamp is really an artifact to trying to make sure we can access the data offline and afterwards. Okay. So the timing is completely inherent to, like it's literally as you pull it off the chip. So you get that high temporal resolution literally at the sensor. Well, we are well until we have time. Oh, so, uh, oh, that's all right. It's well until we have a time to usually get to. Um, so if anyone has further questions, I'm sure we're going to be happy to take them offline. But for now, that's all. Thank you for the lovely talk.